All right. You are listening to the Life Plus God podcast. My name is Alyssa Robinson. I am here with our associate pastor of outreach and missions. Is that the official title? Serving Ministries. Serving Ministries. (laughs) Dang it. I should know that. I put your title on the website. Our associate pastor of Serving Ministries, which I guess encompasses so many different things, Reverend Dr. Nick McRae. Hey, uh, hey everybody. Um, It's good to be here again. So glad you're with us. Okay, so Nick and I, a couple weeks ago, started doing this listen and response type podcast where uh, basically Nick listens to what Pastor Doug Meyer and I are putting out once a month where we're kind of deconstructing and unlearning some of the beliefs that we've carried with us or relearning some things. Um, And so Nick is going to respond to that. Last week, we were talking about uh, the Bible. So really, it was just about Doug and I exploring our feelings around the Bible and where do we get that kind of uncomfortable Mm -hmm. negative feeling Mm -hmm. about it? And where do we feel really positive about it? But it was really all based in feelings. And so I put it out to Nick and I was like, hey, I really want you to put your seminary hat for us this week and uh, come at it from a more scholarly perspective, helping us understand the the uh, basis of the Bible, how it was put together, all of these things. So he's going to go through that for us. But also he sent me a ton of questions asking me about my beliefs on scripture and uh, trying to understand where I was coming from. And so maybe for the first time ever, I'm going to get interviewed and grilled a little (laughs) bit. We'll see what it's like for me to be on the other side (laughs) of the conversation. But he had some really, really great questions. So I want to get to those. But first, Accounting for cultural and historical context was one of the things that that Doug and I talked about. And so if we take the letters of Paul Mm -hmm. as an example, if I'm imagining Paul and him writing these letters, I cannot imagine he would ever foresee these being becoming a part of scripture. Mm -hmm. Um, It's almost as if someone like took my emails that Mm -hmm. I had been writing to individual people and decided these emails are the word of God. And I don't, I wonder what Paul would think about that um, because they were very specific letters to a very specific group of people in a cultural time of depending on what these people were dealing with, Mm -hmm. what troubles they were having. And then another piece of context. And I, I, take issue with Paul all the time, because I think that sometimes the church gets caught up in following Paul instead of following Jesus. Um, And one of the interesting things about Paul that I've learned is, and I'm sure you're well aware of, is he was under the impression Jesus was coming back within one to two years. Mm. And so um, with Paul and his writings, it's all about the immediate future. It's Mm. like, you need to make changes now. And like one of the reasons Paul was so like anti-marriage is he was like, what's the point? You don't need to get married. Jesus is coming back. If you feel like you have to, to fulfill your sexual desires, do it. But marriage doesn't matter. None of it matters. Mm. And so there's been an argument around like, okay, so much of the misshapenness of the church today is because we take Paul's words so literally Mm. when the truth is he was not interested in disrupting systems because he didn't think there was time. Mm. He thought Jesus was coming back so quickly. Like, why would he address major systems of oppression and how we need to face them Mm. as Christ followers when probably in his mind, there's no possible way we'll be able to disrupt any systems of oppression. Just think about like your individual journey and how you can best Mm -hmm. follow Jesus in this limited time that we have. Mm. And now here we are 2000 years <laughs> later, <laughs> just yeah. like taking Paul's word at literally a scripture. And it, so things like that just kind of mess with my head. Mm. Yeah. So that, that's a, that's a really, that's a really excellent question because, um, so, so what you're expressing is a, uh, yeah, is a, is, is a popular, uh, common scholarly, scholarly opinion about, uh, how to interpret certain parts of Paul's letters. And I think that is possible. I think well, the sort of background to that is, I think that Jesus, even Jesus says, uh, you know, nobody knows when he, Jesus is going to come back. He says, not even the son knows, only the father, right? So in, in, in his pre- this sort of uh, interesting way in which Jesus is is in, in, incarnate, right? He says even even sort of even right now in this form, like I don't have uh, I don't have the knowledge about that, so to tell you about it. And so I guess what I would say is is uh, Paul 
you can certainly read it that way. You can also read it as say as him saying, "Look, we don't know when this is going to happen. It could be tomorrow. It could be the next day." And and honestly, that's kind of what Jesus has said, right? And so I think that's good advice. I mean, well, um, it's, it's good advice to live every day as though it could be today. On the other hand, I see what I sort of see your point, right? That does that lead then to complacency, um, right? Complacency, yeah. sort of like, okay, maybe we just sort of let the status quo be because this other thing's going to happen. I think that's, um, I think that is possible. I think um, people don't give Paul enough credit for the ways in which he does challenge those those systems. So, for instance, if we look at the letter of uh, of uh, of Philemon or Philemon, however you pronounce it, different scholars pronounce it different ways. I like Philemon. You'll see that. Um, so, what he's talking to is essentially uh, a, an escaped slave is the subject of the letter, and he's writing a letter back to the the master of that slave, and he is um, uh, sort of uh, you know commending the the, the the master of that slave to sort of like. Um, uh, to, to forgive him that if this slave had owed anything to him because of his, of what had happened that, that, to, 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 uh, you know, that Paul would pay it. Essentially he's, he's encouraging this master to recognize the humanity, then the equality of, of, uh, this person who happens to be in his, in his service. And he even says, uh, make sure you get a room ready for me because I'm coming to visit you. Right. And he says, and he says something like, um, you know, um, you know, I, I could, because of all that you owe me, the authority that I have, I could order you to do this, but I'm not going to do that because I know that I don't have to, right? And so if you, when you read that letter, you come to see that what Paul is doing is he's, he's really subverting in some ways that kind of relationship. And he is, um, and it's not just there, there's other places as well. So, I mean, certainly you, you don't read it and come away with seeing like a 21st century version of how we would imagine ethics would be and human mm-hmm. relationships. You don't come away with that. That's true. But, but Paul, and this is, and it's not just like conservative scholars who, 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 who are saying this, there, there are other scholars. I remember reading, now it's been a long time since I read this book, but I remember reading a book by Karin Armstrong, uh, uh, who, Essentially, is trying to, uh, to to rescue the, the the legacy of Paul, and she is very much not a a sort of conservative. She does, she's not invested in conservative evangelical type of uh, viewing of Paul, but she uh, and she has a particular way of doing this. But she she wants to sort of point out those parts in Paul that are actually challenging those status quo, that are actually elevating women, elevating um, uh, um, slaves, various other kinds of things like that. So it's it's I guess I would say is is um, yeah, like I I, I get where that reading of Paul comes from and why that's such a uh, popular scholarly um, image of, of what Paul is doing. But I don't think that's a necessary way of reading it. And I think that there are other ways of reading it that have um, really strong integrity as well. So um, and I find the other ways more convincing, uh, having spent time, you know, the, the more that I read Paul. Um, and I think the thing too is, I, I, I know what you mean as well about how people um, uh, there caused to be this, this pushback against Paul as a whole. Uh, the idea that like, well, people are reading Paul instead of Jesus. Why don't we go back and like do what Jesus said and kind of not worry about what Paul said. The, the problem there, I think, is that there's this assumption that what Paul said and what Jesus said don't go together, that they're not compatible. Um, and there's also this notion that Paul is like coming and, and either changing or messing up or in some way wrongly interpreting Christ. Uh, I think if we look at the book of Acts, for instance, um, which it really does make cleanly that transition from the Gospels, Luke's Gospel in particular is written by, by the same author as the Gospel according to Luke, um, and we see the narrative of, of Paul and how his sort of conversion happens, how he makes that transition from persecutor to sort of like the, the big missionary of the church, um, uh, we, we come to see that there is, A, there is a really, there's a very organic continuity. And also, when we come to this, think about... Um, uh, and this this goes for not just Paul, but for the whole New Testament. In addition, uh, after the the um, the Gospels, to say that you know wh- where do these letters, where do these writings get their authority? And they get they come, ultimately they get their authority from Jesus, because Jesus tells his apostles, right, go uh, in the end of Matthew's Gospel, for instance, go into the world, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have taught you. Um, of course, Paul wasn't there, when that happened, he it comes later, he has a kind of more unusual experience of Christ. But in the same way, Christ sort of encounters him in the book of Acts and commissions him to go and teach what he has learned from Christ. And so, um, 
And so if we follow the thread of the narrative of the New Testament, um, I think that the, the idea then that Paul is somehow coming in and like changing or adding on to or messing up the, 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 the teachings of Jesus is um, uh, not quite right because he's been sent by Christ to teach and to interpret what Christ said. And I think, um, I think that's what he's doing. Yeah. But. Well, well, one of the questions that, that you had for me mm-hmm. is, uh, when would you say your understanding of Scripture began to change? And I'll say one of the things, and it, I'm trying to connect it to some of the things that you just said, um, one of the things that still kind of rubs me the wrong way, it's not necessarily the Scripture itself. Mm-hmm. It's the way it's been used. Right. And um, I think that the interpretation of um, that that you explained, this is going to sound ugly. I don't want it to sound ugly. So know it's okay. that it's not, I'm not trying to come across any type of way. I got you. I think it's easy to have that interpretation when you're not an oppressed person. Yeah. yeah. And you have not, scripture has not been mm-hmm. used as a, um, form of oppression against Mm -hmm. you. And I think of like, there are scriptures from the old Testament as well as Paul's letters that have been used to say women don't belong Mm -hmm. in leadership in the church. There are same scriptures used to say, uh, slavery is not wrong. Slavery is of God. As long Mm -hmm. as you treat your Mm -hmm. slaves well, um, when we collectively our ethic now, we know, Owning another human being is wrong. Mm -hmm. Seeing humans as property Mm -hmm. is wrong, Mm -hmm. whether it be women or people of color or whatever, the Jewish slaves Mm -hmm. that were in scripture, like it was wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard line. Um, Paul's writings on sexuality, Mm -hmm. it Mm -hmm. has been used to hurt people and to keep people in a specific place Mm -hmm. in the church. And so I think that where my understanding of scripture started to change is when it started being used against me. Um, Because I'm a very, I mentioned in the last podcast, I'm a very outspoken woman. Mm -hmm. Um, And I grew up in the church and that is not always appreciated. I have been called all sorts of names. I'm told I'm rough around the edges Mm -hmm. where the truth is, you know, I communicate in a very, what would be, if we're to gender it in a very masculine Masculine. way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the way I I communicate. And, um, when scripture started being used against me to shut me up, Mm -hmm. that's when I was like, something's wrong. Mm. Something is absolutely wrong because if you are representing Jesus, I don't worship the same Jesus as you. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that when you come from a background, and not to say like I'm the most oppressed person in society, I'm not at all. Mm. I still have so many privileges as Mm. a white woman. Um, But... I see glimpses of oppression thrown at me through scripture and I'm, you know, oppressed people throughout history have seen this when the truth is like, if you read scripture, it's all about freeing, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like Mm -hmm. releasing people from oppression, but somehow that got lost. And I I'm so, it's so difficult, um, to, understand. So Doug did end up buying me the book, Feminist Interpretation Uh, of the Bible. Oh, good. (laughs) And it's really interesting. I love it. But one of the things that it talks about is, um, as women, what can we, how does scripture speak to us when it was written by men in a Mm -hmm. patriarchal society and is also 2000 years later interpreted in a patriarchal society? Mm -hmm. Um, where are we? Like, where is our voice? Mm -hmm. And so the whole book, I've only read the intro, but the whole book is about finding the feminine voice in scripture and talking about more inclusive language of like, why do we call it God's kingdom Mm -hmm. when it could be God's realm? Mm -hmm. And that's non-gendered language. Uh, why don't we sometimes pray our mother who art in heaven, Mm -hmm. as opposed to our father, it's just been hammered in us Mm -hmm. that it's father, son, Holy spirit. And so, um, 
I think that that's what started me on the journey to deconstruction. It wasn't reading the Bible in a vacuum. It wasn't necessarily my upbringing Mm -hmm. in the Christian faith because it was all like love and hugs and, Mm -hmm. you know, super embracing. Uh Like I've, I grew up in the church, like it was a second family. And then all of a sudden when I was in college and I found my voice, Mm -hmm. the church, not this church, Mm -hmm. but many church people who, I did not, you know, realize existed outside of this uh, church. Swap me down. And we're mm. like, nope, that's we're not going to do that. Mm. You don't get to speak. Your mm. opinion doesn't matter. Mm. Like you don't understand. Mm. You don't have the background. Mm. You know, and and um, so I can't think of one particular moment. I was about to ask: Was there a particular experience, or is it just, or is it just that you uh, encountering? Was it maybe encountering ideas for the mm-hmm. first time, or something? Or if it's not a particular experience, because you're, you're talking about this in the context of being in college. Well, one of them that I did bring up um, with Doug was people proselytizing in the Mm -hmm. quad and Mm -hmm. screaming, you know, you're going to hell, only pointing out the women, you're going to Mm -hmm. hell because you're wearing a short skirt Mm -hmm. and, you know, things like that. So that I was like, why did you take time out of your day to bring that message. Mm, right. Like, what, what are you <laughs> trying to accomplish here? all the things you could here? be doing right now or all the things you could be preaching, why is it this? Yeah, right? why is it this? And then also, um, this this is a silly little thing, but the, it's the little things mm-hmm. that just chip away at you and eat at you over time. I was co-president of the Wesley Foundation mm-hmm. um, oh. with a friend of mine. He was fantastic, but uh, we kind of... You know, our our pastor of the Wesley Foundation decided, you know what? I think y'all could co-lead this. Mm. Um, and what it turned into is he got all of the um, Bible study planning, the worship planning, mm-hmm. all of that stuff. And I was responsible for meals. And right. so I would end up right. cooking for 100 people on Wednesday night. And if anyone knows me... I do not enjoy cooking. I'm not good at it. You don't want to eat anything that I cook. And I do not feel like there are plenty of people who love cooking or baking Mm -hmm. as a service to God. I am not that. And so the assumption that I am put in charge of that, it really bothered me because I have so many leadership skills that I felt like were being diminished and I was being given all of the what I would call womanly, right. which yeah. not good to gender it, but like right. womanly activity, Stereotypically feminine yeah. roles, et cetera, And et cetera. it wasn't hateful. It wasn't like there was hate speech right. coming at me in that environment, but it's just me right? being put in that mm-hmm. role when it wasn't mm-hmm. like they didn't even ask me, you know, is this something you want to do? Is this something you feel passionate mm-hmm. about? Where would you like to serve? What ideas do you have for the ministry? It was like, okay, Alyssa's going to be in charge of mm-hmm. meals. And so it's things like that over time happening over and over and over again. Every church that I've ever gone to, the women's ministry is focused on crafting, mm-hmm. cooking, and child care, something. Mm-hmm. Um, and not to say, like, there are so many women who love that stuff, mm-hmm. but I don't. And so I've never felt like I properly fit into the gender stereotypes that the church wants right. to put on me. And so um, it's just a lot of little things. Right. Yeah, so and it's say, hard it's to put your finger like. on, like, an exact moment. They're like, this is the point in time that deconstruction mm-hmm. started for me. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I can certainly see that, right? It's something mm-hmm. that you you sort of like um, uh, sort of begin to see over time, right? Yeah. And then you and then maybe you hear the stories of others, see it happening to others. Yeah, I I uh, so I can certainly see why someone having those experiences would then come to say, okay, well, who who can I really trust to to help me uh, understand the faith, to help me like get a, a, a vision of the faith that, that, that I can understand, that I can relate to? So what would you say, um, so when it comes to ideas about scripture uh, and that sort of thing, how do you decide which voices to trust and which mm-hmm. ones not to? Like what, what's the measure or how do you, how do you, would you approach that? 
So it's that's a really difficult question. I will say my number one spiritual gift is discernment. Mm. So a lot of it, like it sounds ridiculous, but like I go with my gut okay. a lot of the times. Mm-hmm. It's pretty easy for me to recognize false teaching, but one really big red flag for me is the cyclical logic of someone using the Bible to prove the Bible mm-hmm, right. and never going outside mm-hmm. of scripture. Mm-hmm. And I say, but what about this? And then they use the Bible to prove that the mm-hmm. Bible is correct. Um I don't trust that sure. because then I think, mm, I don't know if you've done your due diligence to look outside of this one book. Mm-hmm. Um, I tend to trust people who will bring in history mm-hmm. and say, hey, historically, I don't know if you know anything about the Romans, but here's what was mm-hmm. happening in the Roman you know, community at the time and uh, bringing in other thought leaders and saying, hey, here's what C.S. Lewis uh, thought about this, or here's what Richard Rohr, mm-hmm. I mentioned, mm-hmm. thinks about this, and um, to kind of pull in different perspectives and uh, say that there is not one way, there is not one way to interpret scripture. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you can just listen to what the Spirit is trying to tell you mm-hmm. with each of these, which um So those are the people that I tend to trust more that I'm like, okay, because then what that tells me is um, not only are they willing to do all of this work Mm -hmm. around faith building and research, there's a passion there. And there's someone who at some point said, I need answers. Like I, I don't have all the answers. This book doesn't have all Mm -hmm. the answers Mm -hmm. and I need to go outside of the Bible to really paint a full picture of what this, what I could learn from this. Mm -hmm. And so those are the people that I tend to gravitate towards more, which is what I love about the Methodist tradition is that there is a lot of that like bigger build and it's not, it hasn't always been you know, well, Bible says this, Bible says that, Bible says this. Like when you um, attend a Methodist service, oftentimes they'll pull up scripture, they'll pull up videos Mm -hmm. from like movies or TV shows, Mm -hmm. or they'll pull in articles or or something that illustrates the point and goes outside of scripture. So a question that you sent me is, what is it about Richard Rohr's ideas that you find spiritually fulfilling? And um, this is something, so I'm a lifelong Methodist, but Methodist church, as well as the, I would say the entire Protestant sect Mm -hmm. of the church, uh, we're missing something and it is the mysticism. Mm. And that is one of the things that I really love and appreciate about the Orthodox and Catholic Mm -hmm. faith traditions is that there is a... um, mystical understanding Mm -hmm. of the spirit Mm -hmm. and the ways that it is at work in this world. And I think that's what I relate to most in Richard Rohr's writing and especially like in the book Universal Christ, Mm -hmm. where he's talking about um, Christ is in everything. Mm -hmm. Like, Yes, Jesus is Christ, but you are also Christ, and that plant is also Christ. And we, like the way that God expresses God's self in this world is death and resurrection. And that's something that I've only been exploring within the past three years, Mm -hmm. I think, is like the mystical understanding of spirituality. Because, you know, growing up a Methodist, it is in the name Method. Like there is a way, there is a method that you follow to grow your relationship with Christ. Do not deviate from the method. (laughs) (laughs) And so like, I think there's a lot of great, uh, helpful structure Mm -hmm. in the Methodist understanding of spirituality, but I think it's missing something. Mm. And um, so I also was encompassing that when I was thinking of experience is like the experience of the spirit, which transcends scripture in so many ways. Right. Which I think is, 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 uh, uh, appreciate that clarification because I think, I think that is similar to, it's in the same category as what Wesley would mean by experience, but in his case, he would he would he would say that that experience is um, right that, that that kind of experience, that sort of direct experience of God. You want to have that, but that it would be it, it would not be 
if it were something that contradicted something that was in scripture, right. he, he would, yeah. he, he wouldn't, he would have a, he would, he would not be inclined to trust that because uh, he would see as uh, he would see scripture as sort of giving us um, essentially giving us among other things, right? Not only this, this is this may us too simplistic, but giving us a way of making theological judgments of saying um, that, you know, what's, what can we compare? What can we compare these experiences to, to know um, is it, is it from God? Is it my imagination? Is it um, uh, some something harmful? Is it right? These sort of different things, like like in terms of just where is, is this? Are these uh, experiences coming from? But is there ever the question of like, did Scripture get it wrong? Like, right. did the you know I was inspired by God? I wrote something mm-hmm. down, but my human element got in the way, and I wrote that homosexuality is a sin. Right. Like, right, 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 right. Is it? And I know that there will be a lot of different understandings of that. But like, where does that come into play? Because that's where I have the problem mm-hmm. with the prima scriptura, because I think that sometimes the spirit can guide us to say, OK, maybe I am not bound by that mm-hmm. uh, writing in scripture. And that was not the spirit mm-hmm. of God. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and that, and that's, and of course, and that is, uh, that's really similar in some ways to what, to the way that Richard Rohr, for instance, would approach scripture. I mean, not exactly the same, but, uh, you know, he, so I, it's been a while since I read the entirety of the, of, uh, the universal Christ, but I have reread some of it recently because I was just thinking about it and wanted to make sure I understood kind of the way he, he approaches scripture. And he has, I would say, yeah, he has a, a way of, of doing that that essentially says, um, you know, um, Parts of Scripture reveal certainly reveal Christ, um, and those can we can use those to help understand sort of other things. Um, but there's other parts that don't, right? That, that could be harmful. So some parts are the Word of God. Some parts are uh, right. If it looks like Jesus, if it sounds like 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 Jesus, right? right. Then and th- I feel like that's the litmus test is right. Jesus. If you if you claim to be a Christ follower, mm-hmm. right? The litmus test is Jesus, not the Bible in the entirety. Mm, mm. And so because there is um, a lot, it, it's just, like you said, it spans over 1,500 years. Right. And, yeah, yeah. and so how can we possibly say, okay, everything in this book is absolute? And I think mm. that me as a Christ follower, I'm like, okay, if Jesus talked about it, that's something to pay attention mm-hmm. to because Jesus was I like my understanding of Christ is like God has been trying to communicate who mm-hmm. Christ is mm-hmm. for millennia for, yeah, uh, and yeah. through death and resurrection. Mm-hmm. And then maybe God was like, you're still not getting it. <laughs> okay. Let me make a human like you so that you finally understand it, you know? Yeah. And so if Jesus is that representation of Christ in the world, death and resurrection, how God functions in this world, then that's everything. And sometimes I question, like, why do we even need the rest of it? Why don't we Mm -hmm. just have the Gospels and everything else is like in a separate book that we're like, hey, this can be helpful learning tools, Mm -hmm. but this is not the litmus test for, you know, how the spirit is moving yeah. in this place. That's a, that, that's a great observation. It's a great question. And, uh, cause this, that was, I had, had the exact same question and I, and I, I, there was a time at which it was kind of like, okay, yeah. So, uh, and those kind of hermeneutics, uh, ways that lenses, ways of interpreting sort of made sense to me. And it still makes sense to me. I understand why, like why one would approach that. It's like, look, if Christ is the word of God made flesh, like if this is supposed to be the like primary, most clear, most direct revelation from God that we have, let's look at, at, at Jesus and then let's see what he says and what he does. And then let's compare everything else to that. And, um, I think I actually do think we, we should do that. Well, I guess what I would say is, yeah, I think Jesus is the right starting point for authenticating. Like, how do we, how, how do we, tr- why do we trust the scripture? How do, how do we trust it? Like, why do we need the Old Testament? What I want to know is, what does Jesus think about the Old Testament? What does Jesus say about the Old Testament? And how, how can that help me understand it? And so there's a couple ways to do that. One of those is the approach that Richard Rohr and others take, which is to say, well, it sure looks like Jesus is sort of contradicting the Old Testament. That he's saying, you know, you've heard it said, something from the Old Testament, but I say, right, something that contradicts that. When... Um, 
what I've come to see or what I've come to understand is, is that when we really go and we compare the things that he's countering to the things that are actually in the Old Testament, uh, he's, 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 what he's correcting is bad interpretation, mm-hmm. is this bad sort of, um, you know, pharisaical or other bad interpretations. Like, for instance, when he says, you heard, you've heard it said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, right, uh, that, that when someone strikes you on the right cheek to turn the other cheek. Um, well, if you look, actually, let me, let's, let me, um, well, and, and, and that even would better. Have, that would have been a time, of course, that was before the printing press. Most people couldn't read. And so their only <sighs> understanding of the scripture was what was taught to them right. from the pulpit of the Pharisees or whoever. Right. And so, yeah, that was pretty, pretty crazy of Jesus yeah. to be like, hey, you've been taught <laughs> this, uh-huh. but they are getting it wrong. Right. And exactly. Because that, And that's still edgy, right? And, yeah. You know, it, 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 it's it, right, what he's not doing is saying the Old Testament was wrong. What he is doing is saying all those teachers, the people that have been teaching you about it are wrong. And that's why they um, were like, kill this man. <laughs> right. Right. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, if people, people, uh, yeah, the truth, the truth can be hard to swallow sometimes, <laughs> man. I don't, I know that. Um, the, uh, so, so, so what, what I want to do is I want to see what, what Jesus says about the old Testament. And then you will see things like, for instance, he'll often say later, uh, you know, about how the, uh, about, about how all the, this, the writings, uh, and the law and the prophets were all about him. And there's very many places in, in Luke and other gospels. I, I, um, if I tried to quote chapter and verse, I would get it wrong probably, but where he says um, it, uh, that, right, all the things that they were writing were about me. And then that gives us a clue is to be like, so then we can go and read the Old Testament and see, okay, how is all of this pointing us toward Jesus? How, this, how is it pointing us toward Christ? Um, and we can come to see it as that storyline of like, okay, the, the Bible is, is everything before is sort of pointing us to, helps us understand what we're going to see when Christ sort of comes on the stage. And so, uh, and the way Jesus uses the Old Testament, he tends to quote it, uh, as though it is authoritative in some way, like for instance, in the in the desert when 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 uh, you know Satan appears to him and they sort of have a scripture battle, right? That, that Jesus sort of rather than just sort of saying uh, no, he says, "Well, it is written," right? He, so he uses scripture in that way, um, and and really when we look at the ways that Jesus is using scripture, he's he's affording it a really high level of authority, and so. What I, I I want to have the same mind about Scripture that that Jesus does, um, and that's kind of how I've come to think about that. And then in terms of the apostles, like the later parts of the New Testament, I, it's kind of what I said earlier, right? If Jesus is commissioning the apostles to go sort of continue the work, then then is these are these things that are being written. Um, have been recognized. We've come to see they really, they really sort of, there is a, they, have, they do have an ultimate harmony with what Jesus is saying as continuations and sort of clarifications and of, of what Jesus is teaching, because we read also once again, uh, well, uh, yeah, we read also things when he says, like looking at the narratives of the gospels themselves, where he, or he'll say, or we'll, we'll read things like, um, and, and he did and taught many other things, right? So, uh, the, 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 people like Paul and Peter and John can help us to understand the deeper implications, uh, additional things that we don't get. We even get a couple of quotes from Jesus in the epistles that are not in the gospels themselves. Like it is better to give than to receive. I always thought that was from the gospels. It's actually not. It's from one of the epistles. Uh, and he said, you know, as our Lord said, it's better to give than to receive. Um, and so anyway, that, that's how I've come to understand the continuity of it, right? How does Jesus think of the Old Testament? Uh, the Old Testament, he, he seems to say, is about him, is testifying to him, foreshadowing him. And then uh, when he commissions the apostles to go and teach, uh, th- 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 these letters would be then what, what it is that they're teaching. And so um, on the one hand, yes, I think Jesus, like using like a Jesus, Jesus has the lens for how do we interpret scripture? Absolutely. But then what are the implications? Does it mean that we then don't look at the other stuff or that we look at the other stuff and see um, sort of highlight the things that, that, that are confusing or don't seem to make sense, or do we kind of look for that internal coherence, the way that they're kind of all part of the grand story of scripture of from everything pointing to Christ, to Christ himself, to, uh, his message going out into all the world. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a different way of looking at it, but that's the way this become really compelling to me. Um, well, let me ask you, so, um, 
What is it about the Bible? You obviously have a deep passion for the Bible. I know you've read through it multiple times. You're a crazy person. And so there was a time at the end of last year when you read the entire Bible in 30 days. Yeah. yeah. You're bananas. Like how many... It was hard. Yeah. Like that sounds miserable, but you have a deep love for scripture. So what is it that you find interesting or inspiring about the Bible that hits you deeper yeah. than any other books? Because there's so mm-hmm. many supporting books mm-hmm. that can help you uh, deepen your mm-hmm. understanding of scripture. But what is it about the Bible for you? Yeah. Uh, a few things. I, I, I think... Uh, for, for for one, um, it's that, and this is something that that I had I had already sensed once in a previous read through. But for instance, when I read read it through uh, all in one month, I really began it, and going at its speed through the scripture like that, not getting lost in the details, but getting seeing really the broad scope of it in a short time, really did drive home just the um, the compelling nature of its narrative and the. Um, the, the unity of it. And so once talking about the unity of scripture is another thing that, that a lot of times, you know, critics, uh, or maybe, uh, te- textual critics or various for- schools of criticism tend to highlight the things that don't seem to fit together between the scripture. But when you just sit and read it from Genesis one to the end of revelation, you see that there is this sort of curvature to it. There's this sort of, there is a, an arc of a narrative that sort of does continue throughout it. And you see the same themes come back over and over and over again. Um, so that there is this unity there that maybe isn't, maybe isn't obvious, especially, especially if you're going in line by line, word by word. But when you look at the whole of it, it's just, it's comp- very compelling. The storyline of it is very, it's, it's like a, it's like the greatest epic. So I'm a big fan of the Lord of the Rings, for instance, and like that kind of epic. It's like that only bigger, only more real, only, um, has implications for, for my life. Uh, and, um, uh, so that's just part of it, the compelling nature of it. Another reason is, um, that I, I really do feel and get the sense and come to understand through it, um, that I'm learning about uh, more about who God is, the character of God, because I think too, if we, if we just get stuck in the details those things that seem incongruous, those things that seem like they, they're confusing or that are uh, offensive even, uh, tend to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Whereas once, not, 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 that those, not that we can't resolve or shouldn't work on understanding those bits, but that when we see the, the, the scripture as a whole, um, we see that, that, that it, um, we become really to become to see that, that something about the character of God, I think, that is is, is uh, through there. And I do think it, um, it can add real, vi- not just add vitality, but it can be a, a real source of, uh, of passion and spiritual vitality for people. And I think for me, uh, I, I truly believe that and you, you kind of mentioned in a, um, last time that, you know, when people say to you, look, you know, are you reading scripture? Is it the best way? That's the best way to, to, you know, gear up your spiritual life. Uh, I do think other resources are really helpful, but I think, um, ultimately it's going to come back to, to scripture itself, or are the things that we're using, are they, are they communicating that same, uh, epic, beautiful, true, um, uh, deeply affecting narrative? Um, and so to the degree to which they do that, I think will, will be the degree to which they, they are, can impact someone's spiritual life. That, that's, that's how it seemed to me anyway. And, um, also the other one is, and this is going to lead into a question that I'd like that kind of something I'd like to hear from you is, um, it helps me the more, the better, the better grasp I get on sort of that f- overall flavor and structure of, of, of scripture. It really helps me make judgments like, uh, j- uh, for instance, theological judgments, like what's true and what's false it, in it's sort of theological ideas. What's true, what's false about God who, uh, and also, also just some practical, like ethical judgments, like should I, or should I not do this? Is that, you know, uh, something that honors God or is that something that is destructive in some way? Um, and so I'm thinking, okay, so this, the scripture has come to be for me, uh, uh, the central resource for doing that. But, um, I know you, you've, you've talked about how, you know, you've struggled with the scripture that, 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 that experience and various other sources, right. Have been really helpful to you. So I guess what, what I'd like to know is, is would you say that you have a, a, a personal, um, like a method for, for making those kind of judgments for like theological judgments or even ethical judgments. Is there, is there a, a method you use or an approach or is there a particular standard that you um, tend to lean toward or, or, or into? Socratic method. Okay. So, okay. Can you tell you say <laughs> more say, about that? Yeah. Um, 
I never run out of questions. Mm. I, I know I drive people crazy, but <laughs> um, when it comes to conversations about scripture, it's just why over and over and mm. over again. And then it gets to a point, like with someone like you, I can ask why mm. over and over and over again, and you'll go there with me and you'll continue. There mm. are some people who when you get to the root of it, they mm-hmm. don't know why. Right. And they come up empty of like, well, I just believe it. Right. Like it is what it is. Mm-hmm. Deal with it. Or the church says this, so this is what mm-hmm. it is. Um, and so that's kind of where I get to the bottom of like, okay, are you a trustworthy source? Mm-hmm. Of course, in books, you can't ask the author right. why right. directly. <laughs> but when I'm in conversations with people, um, it's a lot of like, why do you believe that? Mm-hmm. Where did that come from? And like kind of forcing them to deconstruct a little sure. bit. It's so <laughs> mean. It's forcing them to dig down into the root of why they believe what they believe. And through that process, I can tell how much work someone has done mm. or how little work someone has done. Yeah. And I trust people who have done the work Fair because enough. it's not easy work. And so, or I also trust people who are willing to say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's a really good Mm -hmm. question. I don't know. Let me think about that or let Mm -hmm. me read up on that or whatever it is, because then uh, that also tells me you're someone who's willing to do the work and to admit that you don't have all of the answers Mm -hmm. Um, because I don't have all the answers. I'll say, I don't know all day long. And I know like the way that I speak, I speak in imperatives. I'm very straightforward. Mm -hmm. So if it ever comes across that I'm trying to express, I know exactly what I'm talking about at all times. That's not the case. I just have a a pattern of speech that's very confident. Sure. Uh, But there's way more that I don't know Mm. than I know, which is why I'm constantly seeking Mm. of like, what do you think? What do you feel? What has your experience Mm. been? My experience is not your experience. And kind of finding that common ground. Um, So I would say like, that's pretty much it for me is Mm -hmm. like the Socratic method. Um, But also, like I said, a lot of times it's just a gut feeling. Mm -hmm. I can, I can tell when pretty easily when someone's full of crap, (laughs) like it's not (laughs) difficult for me to see. (laughs) And then I, you can tell that I shut it down. Mm. Like, and I'm not, I try not to be rude about it, but I kind of like whether, and it's unintentional. I cut myself off emotionally from, and I don't Mm. invest anymore. I'm like, okay, this person is not where this conversation will be fruitful. Mm. And, um, and you can kind of tell, sure. like you can yeah. kind of tell the hard nosed, closed mind, I believe what I believe and you can't tell me different mm-hmm. um, sort of people. And and that's not the kind of conversation I want to get into mm-hmm. because it'll be destructive for them and it'll be destructive for me because we're both going to leave it frustrated. And I've made that mistake. It's not that I've never walked into those conversations. Oh gosh, it's that yeah. I've made that mistake over and over and over again of trying to have these type of conversations conversations with people who maybe aren't open to it or aren't ready for it Mm -hmm. or whatever it is. And it's just harmful. Mm. Um, So carefully choosing who I enter into these conversations with and then the Socratic method. (laughs) So, so it sounds like the method is, is right. Because, because, you know, that's what I love about Methodism. Right. Right. That there's a method to it. And so it seems like it for you, it's, it's not so much just um, like you, you want the input of other people, right? Yes. But then, so so you, you want the input of others, but then you want to weigh that against your sort of spiritual intuition, your sort of reason, right? And then maybe take what seems useful or genuine or whatever from one person and, and kind of, that seems sort of like, right? So it's conversational, it's intuitive. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. I wish, and I think like we want to say, as Methodists, here's the method, here's the process that you go through. But the truth is, it's going to be different from every single person. You know, Mm -hmm. we've mentioned Enneagram, there's all sorts of like, we are each individually different people. And the way that I approach spiritual conversations might not work for you, might not work for someone else. And so I can't necessarily put a process in place of like, okay, here's how you can tell if someone is full of crap. Mm -hmm. Here's how you can tell if this is a trustworthy resource. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, 
And of course, there's like journalistic things with writings that mm-hmm. there's a checklist of like journalistic integrity or like authorship integrity that you can look through of like, are they citing sources? Are they legitimate are they, sources? Are they, yes, you know, they yes. Can, yeah. So there's those kinds of checklists that you can go mm-hmm. to. But spirituality is so subjective mm-hmm. that um, there's not an absolute <laughs> process for me. And I think... Um, yeah, uh, that makes sense. I, I get that. So when you say spirituality is subjective, and this is one of the th- this is one of the big questions that I that, so this is one of the things I've really had to wrestle with over the years, is that exact question because I remember um, I've, been, I've really been on a journey about that. I had you know, and I guess I c- continue to be. I imagine I'll continue to be on a, j- a journey about this. I forever. hope so. Yeah, I mean, yeah. me too. Because I, I think <laughs> I think because we're always going to be, if nothing else, we're always going to be hit by new questions, new situations, new things yeah. we haven't right that are going to challenge us. And there us are going and, to be things like I see myself as so cold culturally in tuned. And of course, like 20 years from now, I'm going to have, I'm going to be in my fifties and I'm going to have someone in their twenties being like, I don't understand. What is that? I don't, is that, what's that pronoun? I've never heard of that before. And like not, I'll have to like reconstruct the worldview over and over again. Like the worldview of my grandparents is not the worldview I have today. The worldview I have today is not the worldview that even Generation (laughs) Z has. So it's just constantly being open to, okay, I could be wrong. I could be missing something. All right. Well, we've talked about a lot today. Unfortunately, there is, well, maybe fortunately, there is way more to this conversation. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this uh, episode into two parts. So we're going to wrap up part one and then part two will be released next week where we can continue the conversation around uh, scripture, what we believe, what we don't believe, what we are not sure that we believe, everything. But uh, we will continue the conversation next week, and I hope you can join us. Make sure to come back. There's good stuff coming up.